Yeah, my dad kind of came up with that design. Old Ben's baits are better than no bait at all was the rest of it, but it just got on there, Old Ben's baits are better. Just kind of neat. My dad confided in me one time. He said he's not really innovative and smart. He just took stuff from other people and slightly improved it. And uh, I never forgot that. Retro bassin, kicking some ass and wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40-year-old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Out on the bass boat, making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin'. Welcome to Retro Bassin. I'm just getting out of one of my favorite tackle shops and that is Bacon's Tackle in Shreveport, Louisiana. We've made a couple of stops here at Bacon's over the past year looking at some of the epic collections of baits that Michael Bacon has in his personal collection, including probably the most priceless collection of Fred C. Young original Big O's in the world, Jack A. and Jack K. Smithwick's personal tackle boxes, as well as three ultra rare FLB flood minnows. But there is uh, one lure line that I've been meaning to do a proper retro bass episode on since I first met Michael Bacon, and that is his family's old lure line called Old Ben's. Michael's inside getting some vintage Old Ben's memorabilia out. We're gonna be talking history, we're gonna be talking some lures, and we're gonna be hanging out at one of my favorite tackle shops today. Stick around. Actually, my granddad started in 1925. He had a Texaco station. And uh, there, I think the guy's name was Harry Lawler, came in one morning and uh, my grandfather had just got back from duck hunting on Cross Lake and he set his box of shells on the windowsill and the guy said, those shells for sale? And he goes, yeah, you know, he gave him some. So that put the idea to start selling shotgun shells and baits and became Bacon and Edwards. It was the Bass Pro Shop in a hardware store, sporting goods, and paid the bills. And had a jewelry store in it, a post office, a barber shop, let's see, uh, cut and thread pipe, cut glass. Um, they did a lot of stuff going on there. And so everybody hung around there, and that's where all the all the lure innovation came from. And uh, Jack A. Smithwick was really a geologist. His father was Jack K. Smithwick. And Jack loved to fish, but he liked making lures because he made a lot of money with it. But uh, it just wasn't his, you know, he liked to play golf and liked to fish. If he, if he didn't have to come to work, that's where Jack would have been. But uh, like I say, him and my dad just two peas in a pod, and that's that's why they, the lures of Old Benz and Smithwick are identical. Let's see, lures, 1958 is when they incorporated uh, Ridge Runner lures, but they made a lot of lures before that. It was called Bacon and Edwards Tackle Division. So uh, that was all the jigs and the spinner baits and the, you know, those lures. And then uh, we started making rubber skirts because we couldn't get them. And then we started making rubber skirts for the industry. And then uh, 1968, 69, he probably made 90% of the rubber skirts in the world. Yeah, pretty neat. He had a big old punch press and they would roll the sheet rubber out and step on the pedal and the thing would come down and stamp the rubber and it would come back up. And a woman or a man would stick his hands under there and pull it off, separate it and pull it again and start another one. That was the, uh, the regular press. Then about 19, uh, 1968, we came out with the roller continuous cutting die. He just ran it through and it just continuously cut them. Isn't that neat? Yeah. They made for, you know, Old Ben, Smithwick, um, Arborgast, Strike King, uh, anything that has skirts on it, we made it. Living rubber came out later. That that's uh, 
really slowed down the sales of the they're called living rubber, but when you're thinking living rubber, you're thinking archi jigs, bass, you know, bass jigs, and they're, they're either square or round as a rule. Some of them are uh, rectangle, but uh, most of them are square or round, and um, that you could assemble those without rolling them. You could put them on a bait with just a band, where these all had to be rolled on a uh, latex tube. My family made millions of H and H's. <laughs> I mean, literally millions, because H and H was started here in Shreveport. Holly and Holland, I think that is their name, and uh, I think it was a barber and a, an attorney. Not sure, but anyway, uh, they bought the skirts from us. And then after a while, my dad said, "Hey, why don't I just uh, make the whole bait for you?" And uh, I said, "Sure." So that's how that started, and they they made millions of. H and H's uh, in that upstairs of that you can show them that picture later of the mezzanine, and then uh, they died out. And then Billy Humphrey, like I said earlier, they took it and it just took off. I mean, they made it worldwide. We made bucktails. You see this hula skirt? That's that's uh, live action. That was risque back then. Uh, she didn't have a bra on, but you can't see anything. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I don't know why the, the rubber skirt hula ladies on there because these are made out of real bucktails. And back then, the hunters and all that would bring their bucktails to us and we cured them. It smelled so bad. Uh, we scored right down the bone and we used 50% uh, borax, 50 salt, and then you'd have to stack them for you know several months until it cured. Uh, the cured part didn't go on the lure, it just left them where the hair would uh, stay in one place till you cut it off to make the bucktail. And uh, we had a lot, a lot of women making bucktails. They uh, made the hard baits in the mezzanine, which was a balcony over Bacon and Edwards. And uh, Jack Smithwick and my dad were fraternity brothers. And so if you look at the Smithwick lures and the old Ben's lures, they, they look exactly alike. I wonder why. Uh, Smithwick came up with most of them first. My dad came up with a couple, but uh, they made the identical baits. So, uh, and they exchanged uh, manufacturing. I uh, forget what year it was, but the Smithwick plant caught on fire. And then uh, my dad, Jack, came over. I remember, remember him doing that. And came over and uh, we started painting all his Smithwick lures with the Smithwick name on it and all that until he could get going again. And then uh, later on, depending on paint, pigments, and all that, uh, we painted Smithwick and Smithwick painted ours, old bins. So that's kind of a neat deal. And I kind of grew up, you know, around Jack in the plant. Um, he didn't meet Cotton Cordell till 69. Uh, right here in this building, Cotton Cordell paid the rent for uh, Glenn Carper. It's called Carver Plastels Incorporated, in, uh, which later became Mr. Twister. And then in 71, I think he moved to Mendham. And then you know what, what happened after that. It was big time. A uh, guy named uh, Sheldon Maps came down from wherever he's from up north. And my dad and I were going to lunch on Mansfield Road, and I, I saw Sheldon license plate. I said, Dad, that's the Sheldons. He said, what are they doing down here? He said, pull up there. So he rolled down the window and I honked the horn and uh, it was Sheldon and his son. And uh, he said, Ben, what you, he said, what are y'all doing down here? He said, uh, I'll tell you about it. He said, uh, have y'all eaten? He said, uh, no. Nah. So uh, we went to Lowell's uh, restaurant and sat down and that's when uh, they came down to uh, look at Mr. Twister and they ended up buying it. A few years later, we, we had a plant in Mexico, Chihuahua, and we, they moved all the manufacturing down there for the Joker, the Clown, and the No-No. Uh, his name was Jaime Fernandez, and uh, me and Jack and Dad would drive down there. We drove down twice, all the way down to Chihuahua in his, he had a, 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 a diesel station wagon, a suburban st station wagon, and we thought that was just the neatest thing, diesel. And uh, drove all the way to Mexico, and uh, that was interesting. I used to live with Cotton uh, two days a week, 
every other week for a year, I guess, uh, give or take a few months. But uh, we had the thing called worm bar systems. And so uh, that's when we were packaging worms and sending them all, all over. But uh, one of the days, Jaime Fernandez came up from Mexico and because uh, he was always wanting fishing baits and stuff. And he would load up stuff and take them to Mexico and sell them. And uh, me and Cotton were in there. We're fixing to go to lunch. And Jaime uh, said, uh, Cotton, do you have any extra, anything you want to get rid of? And Cotton, he was playing with something on the deal. And he stopped and looked at me. He said, well, Jaime, as a matter of fact, I do. And uh, so he said, do you mind if I, we look at it before we go to lunch? He said, oh, come on out here. Some Cotton took us out and took us all these warehouses. It was just full of paint and lures and all kind of stuff. Well. In these lures was a box about this big. And I was helping, Jaime went to get a U-Haul trailer. So I was helping him load it up. And one of these boxes had egg cartons in there with Fred Young Big O's. And I said, Jaime, you wanna, I'll buy these things. He said, oh no, we don't use them crankbanks where we at. So he said, you can have them. I said, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'll trade you something. And so I had something he wanted. I think it was $35 worth of worms or something. And he said, yeah, I'll trade you those worms for that. And so uh, I had a Toyota Silica lift back, and I had it just stuffed. And I thought, how am I going to get this box in there? So I opened it up, took the egg crate. So these are styrofoam, nasty stuff. So I took them all out, threw the styrofoam boxes away, and piled those big O's in the one box about that big <laughs> and stuck it in my car. In hindsight, you know, I kind of wish I'd have, I'd have kept the cartons. Uh, Cotton said, um, this is the rest of the story. I said, I told Cotton about getting them from Jaime. And he said, you know, Mike, he said, bring, bring me one of those. So I, he was sitting right where you're st sitting. So I went and got he said, yeah, these are the big O's. He said, but we have some, and they're every, it's odd numbers. All of them are odd numbers. And I said, you got another box of these somewhere? He said, oh, yeah. And so I said, I wouldn't mind. I'll pay you for them, Cotton. He said, well, if I can find them. Well, uh, they had a fire. And it's all gone. And I never got to see the box, the other box of big O's. Cause I said, uh, you know, is this the box you're thinking about? He said, no, they were all odd or even. He said, this ain't it. And uh, so I was on a quest to go find the other box, but they had already moved off of Kaufman Drive and uh, they're, they're gone. They're gone forever. Uh, these are all made by, I believe, H.A. Jones Wood Turning in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It's where they're originally at. And what it is, it's got a square, uh, block of wood he'd rip these out and then uh, cut them well anyway these blocks are in there and the lathe will come over and grab it and pull it into a back knife and as it spins 360 degrees it makes a perfect paintable lure the other one the other lays are, are made on a reciprocal copy lathe and they got a blank uh, blank over here in a hob over here and as it as it spins and turns the uh, cutters go down and, and trace out the uh, hob and it leaves little grooves on it and they have to be tumble sanded and sanded and all that but uh royce jones their cutters make a perfect bait it's paintable when you get it you cut the chuck buttons off and it's uh, you tumble them and they're ready to paint whereas uh, Moonlight and Hedden and all them, they had to sand them each bait after they got through. And uh, what was that frog? What a frog and some of the other ones that you can still see some of the grooves uh, on the on the original blanks. Oh, uh, that's a toothpick. Oh, this is one of the devil's horse. Uh, I'm not sure, F200, something like that. And that is a lucky 13 before you cut the cut the bill out. Jack did a lot of custom painting for other companies. That's what I'm talking about. With some more of the keel. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is a F200 
and Royce told me that uh, when he chucked it in, he said he finally figured out how to put a keel on it, which is uh, it's an F200. And what happens, I forget the degrees, maybe 280, 290. It doesn't spin a full 360, and it leaves a keel on there. And uh, Royce, he's the the brains behind all the all the lays. He uh, was fixing to come out with it. And he had sent it to Jack, and uh, I think the story goes, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, they were coming out with it. And then Pradco bought out Jack before this ever came out and just sat there. And so when I went up there and, and bought the lays from Royce, he was telling me about the one with the keel on it. And uh, I looked at that and I thought, ooh, that could be a good bait. So really, this one is, if Smithwick would have kept going, this would have come out. I have no, uh, I have nothing to do with the design of this. <laughs> uh, it's Royce Jones, and I don't think Jack had any input, but it was Royce Jones. That's his baby right there. So anyway, I brought some back, and uh, I'm making them back there now, and I decided to call it a Rolls Royce after Royce Jones. Uh, you you, I tumble them just to get rid of the chuck buttons. When you cut a chuck button off, it's a 90 degree cut and it's got a sharp edge. So you put them in a tumbler and it just sits there and spins and as these things tumble, it smooths off the edge. Uh, then you got to pre-drill. I'll pre-drill all my baits first. And then uh, you put like a little alligator clip on there and you dip them in the base coat. And then I put them on a turner, depending on temperature and what I'm coating. And then you just paint mask and airbrush after that. And I've got all of Smithwick's and Old Ben's paint mask back there in, in the mesh, in the guns. That bait right there. Instead of trying to paint all these little squiggles, they have a copper mask that fits over it that's missing the little bills. And when you spray it, it, it shoots through the holes. And when you come off, you got that. Especially the, that, this is a better example of it. And then, of course, with the eye spots, you just, ladies, the ladies are much better painters than I am, but um, I'm learning. I'm still learning. Um, you can see the progression of it. You just got a base coat white, and then you came in with a uh, green behind a, a bridal veil. It's called tool. And uh, when you hold it behind the bridal veil and shoot it, when you take it off, it's got the, got the design of the bridal veil. Then you do the mask, depending on what okay. colors you're done. But that's a, that's called a, a brim color or chinkapin brim. Oh, this is a neat one. See that? That's a vacuum metalizer. I was uh, 16 years old, and uh, Jack Smithwick had a vacuum metalizer. And the vacuum metalizer, you put all these baits on racks, and you push them into an iron lung. It's a, it's a deal. Had a clear window with a. Like they use uh, helmets on deep sea divers, you know, with the little twist. And then you put them in there and they, it, it shoots a charge through it. And then uh, uh, it's vacuumed, shoots a charge, and the, the little clips get ready to melt. And then when they up the charge, it, it attracts to the opposite pole and coats anything you put in there with metalizer. And uh, those machines are very expensive. And so Jack, uh, this is one right here. That's one that's never been uh, off the clip. You can see it, it shot the gold on the clip itself. And this, Bacon Edwards Tackle Division were the first lures he came out with. And then um, Old Ben, he just decided to come up with Old Ben. I'm guessing probably 60, 59, 60, somewhere in there. And then uh, my grandfather bought a peanut parcher and I'm guessing 59, 60, and parched peanuts, and they called it Old Ben's Goobers. And so uh, that's when it came out with this uh, goober tail worm. Uh, and I don't ever want to pour plastic again. That was a nightmare uh, when you're 15 years old and you got pimples coming up and you add worm oil to it. It just really made it worse. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's where the Old Ben Scuba came from, the name. I think Pico Perch was one of the first ones. 
Uh, that was a Pottery Island Lure Company. Ed Hinkle was the guy's name. And uh, anyway, something gets selling good, everybody copies it. And so I had and copied it, Bayou Buggy, uh, Smithwick, uh, and then Old Ben's. We all, we all copied them. But uh, that's what those are. These are Old Ben's here. You had the uh, Hobo, the uh, Millionaire. That's the only two he made that I'm aware of. The Hobo was supposed to be opposite of the Millionaire, obviously. And uh, originally he had like gold hooks and gold uh, hook hangers, and we used to, uh, I used to plate the hooks in gold. It was had a big jar with the lid on it, and uh, you put them all on a little chain and drop it down there, and you can see it just turn gold. As bass fishing progressed, people started throwing bigger baits for bigger fish, like Doug Hannon came out with the big, big baits, and uh, so everybody came out with some big baits. But actually, Head and all them really had big baits to start with because you couldn't throw a small bait on a little bitty reel that the handle spins backwards and you got a hundred pound braided line. It wasn't going very far. So uh, anyway, the big baits came back out and um, that's what these are here. Yeah, there's, there's, your, uh, there's your bass taker. Here's your difference between your, your water gator and your bass taker. See the difference? Look familiar? <laughs> These set just like this, or maybe slightly like that. Um, it's just a, a walk the dog bait. It's kind of neat. Um, my dad came up with these. Crybaby is what he called them. And uh, he just removed the hook over here because around here there's just all kind of moss and hang ups and stuff. So he, one less hook helped. He had a 15 hook dowel jack in it down to. A one three prong hook. It's still still get hung up. We have the Magnum Tor Mag and then a regular Tor Mag. And that's just his answer to a uh, head and torpedo. But these are all wood. Yeah, this is this is an old Benz right here. This is called a Hustler. And this also, uh, Smithwick made some I think called for, for Bass Buster. Remember Bass Buster made the exact same thing. A lot of, lot of trading uh, body shapes uh, at that time. Yeah, my dad kind of came up with that design. Old Ben's baits are better than no bait at all was the rest of it. But it just been on there, Old Ben's baits are better. Just kind of neat. My dad confided in me one time. He said he's not really innovative and smart. He just took stuff from other people and slightly improved it. And uh, I never forgot that. Th they all did. Jack cotton we might we made boats too this is uh kind of on the order uh it's not a tide craft it's uh more stick steering and it's a it's a uh, gosh i can't think of the design but anyway he made a lot of these back in the 60s and 70s and sold through bacon and edwards uh the old hardware store and this is actually the building we're in now and um he had this painted on the boat and my sister and my brother didn't like skiing and driving around the lake in it with this all this lettering on the boat. So they, uh, one morning, they got up on a Saturday and took Brillo pads and scrubbed it all off. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what my dad paid to have that hand painted on there on both sides. And uh, he came home that evening and uh, my dad was a Sunday school teacher, but he almost cursed that day, and uh, <laughs> I'll never forget that. Uh, there it is, back there hidden somewhere. That's it, right there. Old Ben's boat. And that's the building there, the Bacon and Edwards. That's uh, uh, I think this, that was the last addition they did to it. It's with the largest uh, glass fronted retail uh, store in the United States when Libby Owens Ford did that. And that next painting is my grandfather and uh, one of his helpers there in front of the uh, original store. It was a lot smaller than the than the added on part. 
And the next guy, that's my dad in the plaid and Uncle Sonny uh, in the uh, cream colored shirt. That's the Bacon and Edwards. And the next picture is me and my dad on Saline Lake uh, fishing topwater lures. And the one on the right is Jack Smithwick's father, Jack K. Smithwick. And I don't know who the guy is um, standing next to him. But that's actually in Jack K. Smithwick's garage where he started. That is inside the garage, and that's the beginning of Smithwick Lures. Uh, Jack K. Smithwick, I think, sold business, uh, business machines, and, and uh, he got into the lure making, uh, and he would hand them out when he s did his regular business route, and then people started asking for them, and it just blew up. And that's how Smithwick Baits got started. Okay, this is the picture of Bacon and Edwards here. Uh, this is the uh, final edition. At that time, it was the largest plate glass window display retail store in the United States done by Libby Owens Ford, which was here in town, by the way, which my great-grandfather came down in the 30s, I think, and uh, was a glass cutter uh, from Buffalo, New York, and uh, was here when they fired up the glass factory. Oh, this is neat. This is the paint. This is the paint booth. This is uh, Jenny and Helen Lackaby, I think, and that's my dad. That's old Ben, and these are all the old Ben lures, um, you know, that's uh, being painted. That's where I learned to paint, but I really wasn't very good at that time, and I'm still not. I can pick up a lure and kind of tell who painted it. You know, it's kind of neat. Uh, these 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 ladies got really good. I mean, that's all they did all day long. They just sit there and talk and paint and not even look. Um, and that was the packaging department. Back then, they used uh, coffee cans, and they had the baits hanging on the inside and another row on the outside. And uh, that's that's where they kept the baits from getting all tangled up till they packaged them. Another good friend of ours, Wayne and, Wayne Kent, Wayne and Judy Kent. They own Cream Lure Company. Uh, he's passed. Miss all these guys. They, uh, they're about all gone. Another Smithwick. That's kind of neat. Have you seen the Gandhi Dancer? That was his, uh, one of his mottos on the lures. And he actually made signs and put them up on all the lakes. Um, this one big board that says, have you seen the Gandhi Dancer? And that's all it said, and it left uh, it left the public to go find out what a Gandhi dancer was. Pretty good, uh, pretty good idea. I've always liked frog skin lures, and uh, and I wanted you know continue in the bait business like my dad and all them, but I thought I don't want to do all that. Uh, you have to do numbers, and I just wasn't going to do it. And but anyway, I was intrigued with the frog skin. And I grew up on Best and We caught a lot of frogs. And then I went fishing with a guy named Nate Durham, and he was talking about fishing frog skins on Saline Lake. And uh, I said, I, I can do that. And so I did a lot of research and a lot of trial and error and search, searching old patents. And, uh, and I found out a way to take a frog skin and stretch it over a lure. And that's, lure looks familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Smithwick Old Bands which I have quite a few already made back there. And uh, anyway, uh, a lot of trial and error stuff, but um, I've always liked the moon, moon, moon rise, fishing on the lake at night. I fished a lot at night with the moon, full moon. And then uh, Moonlight's kind of, the bait company's kind of got the same, uh, talking about the moonlight. But anyway, so I, I make a lot of frog skins. I'm kind of running low right now. And I got too many irons in the fire to uh, try to catch up. But I was talking to Jack one day, and uh, he, he really liked that. And uh, he kind of helped me with some of the names. I said, uh, I said I'm going to use your toothpicks and stretch some frog skin over it. He said, what are you going to call it? And uh, I said, well, I guess I can't call it a toothpick because Pratco would sue you. And uh, he said, yeah, they would. And I said, I thought about shoe pick instead of toothpick. He goes, I like that. That'll work. He said, now, he said, uh, are you and your wife, Janet, going to put these together and your kids? I, he, he, he laughed. And I said, no, I said, I'll tell you what I am going to do. Uh, we're going to put them together, but instead of selling them, 
for resale at a buck fifty or whatever like you've done your whole life. I said, they're going to be 50, 60, 70 bucks a piece. He said, that'll work. That'll work. And uh, anyway, that was, it was fun growing up around Jack and Cordell and my dad, Old Ben's. And so that's where that came from. Yeah, see, I got a frog these. Those are neat. Look at that. This is cattails. Got a frog. And uh, that's some of my frog skin paint jobs. I really I sell a lot of those. And they're they're easier to do than the frog skin. And I really kind of like this because on this uh, paint base, I can do a chartreuse underneath. And the uh, crackle part shines through the frog skin. And you can get a little bit of chartreuse in there, which I think is really neat. See that? Ooh, look at all these. Check those babies out. Isn't that cool? But anyway, I got a lot of frog. I got a lot of frogging to do. A lot of hooking to do. Just running behind. Yep, this is the one that uh, uh, Royce Jones and Smithwick were working on. That's called a Rolls Royce. And you talking about cut up? It really cuts up. I mean, there's not a bait like it. There's not one out there. Period. Like this, that'll cut up. I took this to Mexico, and I know Mexico you can catch fish on a stick. But I caught 183 bass in one day on this right here. This is uh, this is an actual Smithwick Jingle Bob. Smithwick actually came out with this, and it worked for a while, and then it just kind of I don't know something about it. They just didn't go. I think they had trouble setting a hook on this thing because there's not much gap in here. And I took it in a fresh to uh, stretched a bacon frog skin on top of that puppy. Um, and this is a crackleback finish that I did. I painted this. This is a, uh, a imitation 15 hook Dow Jack minnow uh, with the Smithwick blades on it. And I got these are real glass eyes. These are uh, made. These are flint glass eyes made during the war in the 40s. Uh, this little baby's a creek chub pikey minnow with with my natural frog skin paint job. Uh, I actually uh, started. I came up with the paint, frog skin paint, because it's hard to stretch a frog skin uh, when you get into different uh, folds and crooks. Like that would have been tough there. Eager did it for years, but it always puckered up right there. So I decided to do a paint job on that. This is the Spotted Ape. This is what uh, I guess came out in the, in the 40s, 50s. Pfeffer kind of made one similar. But uh, Spotted Ape became real popular for a while in Smithwick, Old Ben's. Um, can't think of all the rest of them. Uh, this right here is an actual frog skin over a pawpaw. Uh, custom, custom frog skin. I think it's a pretty good job. It wraps around the front. You would think a frog skin would stretch, but they don't. You can shrink them, but you can't stretch a frog skin. And I never would have dreamed that. Uh, after a lot of my research, I found out that a frog only uses its bones and its muscles. That's why it can jump so far. But the reason why it can really jump far is that the frog skin itself doesn't stretch and it uses the skin to pull against to jump instead of just the bones. If we had our skin that didn't stretch, this, we could probably jump as far as a frog. Um, and then this here, that's a neat little toothpick. It sits about like that, and this is the one I call a shoe pick. I designed this by, this logo and all that, and uh, a couple of artists, uh, Roger McCoy did the this um, cypress tree, and Phil Wakely did the overall design. Uh, and then this is an old bass from one of our uh, block printers. Uh, of Bacon and Edwards. Let's see, I don't know if I got one. It's, it's on the order of this. See there? Uh, you know, it's turned around and uh, it's basically the same thing. It's altered a little bit. And then uh, I drew out the design and, and actually Phil Wakely did the final, final picture, which I'm proud of. There's a lot of stuff I stole from other companies, like uh, Creek Chubb Bait Company. Eh. That's, a, that's 
I like I like I like the creek chub deal. And then uh, Cotton told me he said, Mike, he said people like to read stuff. He said when it comes to lures, said I always put something in my box, something they can read. He said they got to read something. If they don't have anything to read, the bait's not going to take off. And so uh, anyway, that's where I got a little reading stuff on there. Eager Bait Company did it, and uh, there may have been a one other one. Can't remember. I'll let me tell you about Eager Bait before I, before I pass that up. I was in here one day, and this lady came in, and uh, she was kind of had like a little bit of a palsy or something, and kind of came in, and and uh, she said, "I am looking." Remind me of uh, what's her name, Catherine Hepburn. And uh, she said, I, I am looking for a bait my grandfather made. And uh, I'm thinking, yeah, everybody makes lures. And uh, I said, really, what kind of bait? What? I said, I don't remember the name of it, but it was, he made several like this. And I said, well, what's your name? She says, my name is Jane Bell. Jane Eager Bell. And I went, Eager Bait Company? She said, have you heard of them? I said, well, yeah. I said, what bait do you want? I said, do you have one? I said, I do. But I said, uh, I said how much? I said, uh, they're expensive. You don't have any old photographs of uh, your grandfather in the lure? He said, I do. So she brought me, uh, I said, I'll trade you. I I I'll go back and look, see what I can dig up. And you bring those pictures in. And she came back in the next day and had a picture of a grandfather standing on a uh, fence post about this big around a gate post and uh, addressing the workers of the uh, Bar Bartow, Florida, I think that's where they're from, uh, the workers out there and a few other stuff, uh, pictures of him holding a bunch of fish. But anyway, it's just kind of neat. Something you get on your mind and it just comes to you. I mean, what are the odds of Jane Eager Bell coming in here uh, in the lure business? I mean, it's just wild. It's just wild. My life's been like that. Just stuff just kind of comes to you. If you have it on your mind, it just shows up one day. It's just really, really wild. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassoon.